this, this question comes from someone who uh, is a leader of the Stanford group, but also is a former uh, cabinet member. She's an economist. She says, Lynn, we're taught, for the most part, that any truly intelligible universal principles, and I suppose in that sense, any actual truth doesn't exist. Now, it would seem to me, in, in reflecting on it, that it is that very notion that underlies the whole idea of monetarism. And this has come up uh, in discussions of, uh, of, our, of our group in comparing monetarism to what you have, uh, for what you have called for in terms of a, of a new economic system. But the fact is that monetarism, and that is really what we are all taught, is that reality can somehow be represented by an, by an essentially statistical notion of value and of monetary value. Now, the question that this raises, uh, at least as I see it, is one of mathematics versus physics. Mm -hmm. For the most part, economists are trained in mathematics. And we are told, in fact, we are ruled by the idea that any economic principle that we put forward must be qualified mathematically. Now, obviously, the physicist takes a very different approach. And one of the things that has become immediately apparent to us is that your triple curve function could never have been arrived at purely from the standpoint of mathematics. <laughs> Therefore, and please understand, we're not trying to replace you, but we're trying to figure out why it is that you were able to do this when no one else was. And somehow, it seems that it is in this area of mathematics versus physics in dealing with questions of economy and of national economy that the answer lies. Would you comment? Well, of course, the whole system, mathematical system of economics is a fraud inherently. And it was based on an imperialist system to begin with. And it's against humanity. Now, the question, the question should be is, what is causality? There is no concept of causality in a mathematical economics. Huh? We choose one thing over the other. What's the difference? Well, someone says the mathematical equation. Crap, it has nothing to do with it. It's causality that's important. And we don't, we, when we use a financial system which is statistical, it never works. Why? Look, in no case in, hu in history, the known history of mankind, has mathematics or mathematical economics ever succeeded in producing an improvement in the conditions of life. Never. So mathematics has, in that sense, has constantly failed and will always fail. What happens, first of all, look, you have to look at it from the standpoint of chemistry and life processes and chemistry. Well, you have to have an actual science. And there's no science in mathematical economics, none. And the results are always bad. As, as the case history of the United States since uh, the death of Franklin Roosevelt shows. Always wrong. American history, always wrong. History of Europe, always wrong. We have the greatest, with the greatest perfection of mathematics per se, with no physics in it, which was introduced by reductionism, especially since Adam Greenspan came into power and these innovations. The greatest freedom of mathematics to test everything without any difference for quality. The result has been the greatest catastrophe in all human history. So any kind of mathematical economics as such has been proven again and again to be a total failure. Now, if you want to say if failure is a success, your measure of success, then mathematical physics is superior. 
The fact of the matter is you, have, you live in a universe which is essentially consonant with what is defined by Vernadsky's conception of the three qualitative phase spaces of which existence is composed, at least experimental area. The non-living, living processes as such, and the human mind. Three different phase spaces. Now, what do we do? Mankind does not live naturally. Mankind's achievement is to be highly unnatural. I don't want to encourage certain tendencies by that, but <laughs> that it is unnatural in the sense of the typical ordinary uh, physical chemist who is not a physical uh, not, is not really a, uh, a, prop, a competent uh, a physical chemist. What is the physical chemistry of the universe? We have the physical chemistry we identify with the non-living, that is, which has no antecedent as an organized process. Uh, then we have processes which are living processes inherently, or residues of living processes. Then we have humanity, which is not the same, quite the same thing as any other form of living process. So we have the three categories. These are dynamic, they are universal and dynamic. They interact. The universe is a composite of these interaction of these three phase spaces and everything that's derived from it. So now, how do we live? Let's take a typical case of iron. How do we get iron? Well, we, get, we could get iron in many ways, hypothetically, but how do we actually get it? How have we gotten it in terms of the 18th and 19th and 20th century? We went to areas where a lot of little animals and plants died. We went and he robbed their graves for iron. Now, iron is all over the planet. It's a universal thing. But why do we go and rob graves to get iron? As around the Great Lakes area, it's one of the great deposits of iron. And we rob the graves of the little creatures that died there. That's how we get iron. Why? Because the little creatures who used iron you know, as part of their biological process, would, when they died, they would have left a concentration of iron in their little dead bodies. And you can go there and say a prayer over them. <laughs> so therefore we found that the, 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 the sources of richest concentration of iron ores for us, such as bog iron in a, in a New Jersey swamp, huh? which is where the Revolutionary War got its metal iron from New Jersey, from the bog iron swamp. Huh? So we concentrate on the rob grave robbing of living processes. And we find that we, we go and we take the areas which have the richest concentration of iron, which means the least heat, the least coal used up in order to refine the stuff, and we leave behind the things that are not quite as efficient, that consume too much power in order to reduce this thing to a form of usable iron. Now we find out that by doing that, we tend to exhaust the richest resources of various kinds left behind in the graveyards of various kinds of species. That's how we get them. We have, a, we have the lithosphere, and on top of this you have a biosphere, which is developing. It selects certain materials from the environment, grabs it, <coughs> takes it into their bodies, food, 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 for this little creature. Yeah. These things die, and they leave behind these deposits. And you go running around the world to find out what the kind of species was loose in this area, and they will give you the best concentration of this kind of deposit from the periodic table. But then you're using it up. Are you using it up? No, you haven't diminished the total iron in the universe on the worth. It's still there, it's still about, but it's, it's now dispersed. It's not in graves you can rob anymore. You have to go out and rob other graves, or you have to take other resources, and you have to get more powerful means of reducing resources in order to make them equivalent to what had been the richest resources of this iron. So the, for the essence of the thing is for human ma humanity to exist, several things are necessary. Humanity must increase its power measured 
in heat energy or heat power per square kilometer, per square centimeter, or smaller. And by increasing our power, by increasing the energy flux density of the power applied, we are able to make poor resources better than what had been previously considered rich resources. To do that, we have to develop infrastructure, a, a total systemic infrastructure. We have to develop an infrastructure which is able to organize the application of energy, power, in various ways, which makes it possible at various points in the Earth to extract economically a raw material from the periodic table uh, and to distribute it. Because you're getting it here, you want it over here. That requires a system of power to deliver this stamp stuff. So therefore, you can take the increase of the energy flux density uh, per capita per square kilometer of the planet is a limiting consideration. So now let's look at economics from that standpoint, which is called the science of physical economy, which in its modern form is based on the work of many scientists, especially the followers of Bernard Riemann, such as Max Planck, uh, such as Albert Einstein and Vernadsky. That is real economic science. Now then, the other part of it, well, it's not just economic, but it's, it's political also. Because what kind of a political system do you have of coordination among people to do all the various things, including distribution, to make this system work? Look at it from the standpoint of Vanovsky. Look at it from the standpoint of physical chemistry as defined by Vanovsky. What do you have to do in terms of human organization of human activity, development of power systems, transportation systems, management in general, to make this work? And to keep society progressing and not deteriorating entropically. That's physical chemistry. Now let's take those standards and let's measure the performance of an economy by that standard, by that yardstick. And you have it. That's the problem. You need a science of physical economy, which means that you do have to consider all these psychological and other things, because they involve in the way in which you bring about the organization of the effort society to solve this problem. And it's the same way we're going to go to industrialize the moon, which is one of the easiest chores before us and how we're going to get to Mars in less than 300 days uh, and end up as a piece of jelly, uh, uh, which would be going to make it difficult to control the machine to get back. Uh, so therefore, that is the meaning of economics as it's taught is gibberish. And we know it's gibberish because every time you use it, you end up in bad trouble. So you have to test things by their effects. But you have to choose the right effect. You have to find the time scale on which you have to measure the effect. So there's nothing scientific about what is taught as economics today. What is taught is how to behave to make the blood suckers rich. <laughs>